The 5th century BCE was a roller coaster for Thebes. There was an unlikely ally, a chance for payback, and even some culture wars. Join me for Thebes, Revenge and Rivalry on the Ancient History Hound podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Ancient History Hound podcast. My name's Neil, and in this episode, I'm going to talk about Thebes in the 5th century BCE and how it moved from the lows of post Plataea to emerging as a very powerful city-state. Before I get going, I just want to say thanks for listening. If this is your first episode, well, first of all, I hope you enjoy it, and perhaps you can look back through the catalogue of the other episodes I've got to see if there's anything else you might be interested in. If you are a returning listener, fantastic! Again, I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me and coming back for some more punishment. Podcasters can be a funny bunch. We spend a lot of our time trying to find new listeners and marketing our podcasts and whatnot. And that's a great thing, and it's a really important thing. But we should always remember that people are coming back to listen, and we've already got people listening. And from the stats that I can see, I know that there are quite a lot of people now coming back to my podcast. I've got a lot of returning listeners. So if you're one of those, again, really appreciate you taking the time. If you are a returning listener, or in fact a new listener, and you've not had the chance to, if you can review or recommend, rate, whatever it is on the podcast that you're listening to, that really helps me get some visibility as well. On the subject of visibility, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and now, shock horror, even TikTok, where I'm ancient blogger. Trust me, TikTok is very much making me feel like my namesake. And on the subject of this podcast, you might have noticed that I've recorded one previously on Thebes, titled... Thebes, Walls, Teeth and Persians. This focused on the foundation myth of Thebes and went from the Mycenaean period of Thebes all the way through to the 5th century BC and the invasion of Greece by the Persians. Though this episode follows from that, you don't need to have listened to that one before, but it might be of interest and give you a bit more background, so give it a go. My starting point then is the 5th century BC, and just as a caveat, I'm going to drop saying BCE all the time now because the dates you hear are pretty much all BCE. If there are any that aren't, trust me, I'll let you know. In 479 then, we'll begin. The Persians had lost at Plataea, a location in Boeotia which was a state or region in which Thebes was to be found. This was a time of what are known as city-states or polis, the singular being polis. Typically, you have an area dominated by one city-state For example, Attica is the region in which Athens was the dominant city-state. In Boeotia, things weren't as simple, and Thebes wasn't necessarily the ruling city there, though it had always wanted to be. In the previous century, Plataea had actually broken away from Theban authority, and initially gone to the Spartans for an alliance. Plataea, by the way, being one of those towns or cities in Boeotia. Sparta rejected them and suggested that Athens would be a much better fit. After all, Boeotia and Attica are neighbours, they're bordering states. Actually, I should mention the point that Thebes and Athens were pretty close together. It was only around 30 miles between the two. Plataea was to the south of Thebes, so even closer to the border with Attica and therefore Athens. Sparta hadn't just decided this on logistics. In fact, there's a strong suspicion here that it was playing politics. If Plataea now sided with Athens, that might lead it to falling out with Thebes, and this is exactly what happened. Thebes fell out big time with Athens over Plataea being its new ally. This all happened, by the way, prior to the Persians invading Greece in 490 and with the battles in 480, and it'll have a big consequence later in the 5th century, which I'll cover later in the podcast, and hence me giving an overview now, because I'll be referring back to this later on. When Persia lost at the Battle of Plataea, so did Thebes, because Thebes had sided with the Persians. At Plataea, they'd fought against their fellow Greeks, and after the battle, Thebes was castigated. Initially, the leaders of the pro-Persian faction were taken by the Spartan king and executed. The city itself was left, though now it had a stain upon it which just wouldn't wash out. Thebes was accused of being a Medizer, that is to say, one who would side with the Persians, though Medizer takes its name from the Medes, who were a different factional people altogether from the Persians, but, you know, you get the idea. In the early part of the 5th century, Persia had taken up the role as public enemy number one for the Greeks. In response, the Greeks had abandoned their normal habit of falling out with each other, and in fact, Athens had even formed an alliance called the Delian League with other Greek city-states, 
and this aimed to respond against any perceived future threats from Persia. But there were none forthcoming, and without an enemy to unite against, it was all too easy to find reasons why you might want to fall out with your more immediate neighbours. In the period following Plataea, Thebes seems to have kept quiet, but in the 460s, this was to change with the First Peloponnesian War. And some of you might be scratching your head at this point. After all, wasn't there a Peloponnesian War which was later? And if so, why wasn't the later one called the Second Peloponnesian War, as opposed to just Peloponnesian War? Yeah, I know, it's a bit confusing, and it feels a bit like what I went through when they started to release more Star Wars films. So just to recap, the more famous Peloponnesian War took place between 431 and 404, and I'll come to that later. But the first Peloponnesian War was hugely important for Thebes, as you'll hear. The first Peloponnesian War saw two groups clash. On one side was the Delian League, led by Athens, and on the other was the Peloponnesian League, led by Sparta. These weren't groups formed with the intention of warring with one another, and there's a lot of nuance I'm missing out here. However, for the purposes of this episode, I just need to mention them because the dynamic of two power blocks is a recurring motif in the 5th century, even if the sides, or rather the members of the sides, occasionally switch teams. 460 is given as when the first Peloponnesian War started, but it wasn't until 457 that Athens and Sparta finally met up. And they did so at Tanagra, which is around 15 miles, 25 kilometres southeast of Thebes, and therefore 25 miles, or 40 kilometres, northwest of Athens. The two sides were there to settle a dispute over Phocis and Doris, two smaller regions in central Greece, but historian Thucydides suggests there was an ulterior motive to all of this. The Spartan army were there because Thebes had asked for their assistance in helping them become the preeminent city in Boeotia. And by doing so, Thebes could then help Sparta by opposing Athens and being an ally in the north to them. The result was a Spartan victory, but at some cost. Both sides limped away. Sparta's homelands were in the southern Peloponnese, so they had a longer journey back. Athens, on the other hand, had been beaten, but was much closer to home, where it could heal up and replenish. And that's exactly what Athens didn't do. Because just 60 days later, after losing that battle, they put the army back in the field, but this time against Boeotia itself. The decision to mount an operation against Boeotia so soon after the defeat at Tanagra could support the idea that the real threat had been Boeotia all along, and that Sparta's willingness to deploy a force there, albeit in conjunction with a separate dispute, was just a bit of a cover story. What Athens therefore feared was a new front on its western border with Thebes. An interesting angle on the quick deployment is given by Bardunius and Ray, whose book I'll put in the episode notes. By the way, these episode notes will be on the ancientblogger.com website, so don't forget to check them out for all the bibliography, maps, diagrams, that kind of thing. Anyway, back to the point made by Bardunius and Ray. They noted that in the 5th century, the quick deployment of a force only accounted for 25% of battles. Yet when this strategy was employed, it had a success rate of 85%. There are reasons for this. The logistics made this type of option very difficult, hence its scarcity. But Athens was able to move its force against Boeotia and Thebes, and at Enophyta win a battle there. The defeat of Thebes by the Athenians is somewhat glossed over by Thucydides, who simply noted that Athens now took control of Boeotia. But what did that mean exactly? We might understand it if it meant placing troops or garrisons or that sort of thing, but that wasn't a real logistical option, and it didn't need to be. Professor Cartledge makes the very sensible suggestion that what Athens did was slightly alter the political setups in those towns and cities in Boeotia. The traditional form of government which had been there, certainly in the last hundred or so years, was an oligarchy, and this was very common in ancient Greece. Effectively, it was power restricted to a few select elite families or nobles. Political opportunism isn't a modern thing. There was always a group or a faction who were looking to either gain more power or just get on the ladder. This could have meant that under the control of Boeotia, democracies started to appear, albeit very basic ones. Alternatively, oligarchies could be now just that bit more pro-Athens. There's a comment Thucydides made later on about Boeotian exiles, and perhaps all Athens did was ensure that those who had political power, and who had been fervently anti-Athens, were now kicked out altogether. The gap was then filled by those a bit more pro-Athens. But things change. 
And if a week is a long time in politics, then 10 years is an era. In 447, Thucydides reported revolt in Boeotia. He commented that members of the exiled party gained possession of some Boeotian towns, including Chaeronea and Orchomenus. These were those individuals then, which Athens had identified and removed, which I mentioned a few seconds ago. They returned to Boeotia and took no time in trying to change things back. It's worth remembering that exile wasn't always permanent. Perhaps Athens thought that 10 years would be long enough for things to die down and for their return not to be that effective. Boeotia was now revolting. No jokes, please. An Athenian force was dispatched under a general called Tolmides. Initially, he was successful at Chaeronea. They not only took the city, but were able to enslave the agitators and they left a garrison. But on the way back, they were attacked at a place near Coronea. The Boeotian force was composed of Boeotian exiles, but also, and perhaps more concerning for Athens, by exiles from Obia. This was an island off the Attic coast, which was in fact a member of the Delian League, and therefore under Athenian control. Thucydides even added that others joined the Boeotians who simply shared their politics. So this force wasn't just a local response, it included other disaffected people, who presumably weren't fans of Athens, and in a way, this isn't wholly unexpected. The Delian League at this point had been taking quite a different shape, that of an emerging empire run by Athens for Athens. Little wonder then that those members on it who had initially signed up to defend against Persians were finding their membership a little, well, I suppose, forced. At the Battle of Coronea in 447, the Athenians were soundly beaten. Prisoners were taken, and the resulting treaty got Athens its prisoners back, but lost Athens, Boeotia, and therefore control of it. It also started a domino effect, with Euboea and Megara both rising up against Athens, and it even led to the Spartan force invading Attica. The resulting political tourniquet between Sparta and Athens named the Thirty Years' Peace, though in reality, it would be half that time before everyone got angry and started fighting with each other. But before I get to that, there are two big events which Thebes was involved with, which happened shortly after. The first is the formation of the Boeotian Federation, sometimes called the Boeotian League and even Boeotian Confederation. This was a political structure which is dated to around 446. The exact workings of this new political structure isn't clear. A source often cited for it is a fragment which dates to much later, actually 395. Thucydides mentioned the four councils of Boeotia, who he noted formed the supreme authority of that state or political entity, and Alex Wilson referred to 660 councillors serving, with 240 being from Thebes, and I wonder if these were allotted across these four councils. What we can be sure of is that Thebes was now a primary decision maker for Boeotia, and the Boeotian League, Federation or Confederation. It would determine the response of Boeotia, and had fulfilled an ambition of sitting at the head of the table. Perhaps in tandem with this was Thebes and thus Boeotia's decision to join the Peloponnesian League, which, as I mentioned, was headed up by Sparta. It didn't mean they were wholly obedient to Sparta, but it did give a firm signal to Athens on about which side it was likely to take. So by 446, Thebes might have a nice sit down, a cup of tea, and feel very, very good about itself. In less than 40 years, it had moved from being seen as a pariah state, or pariah city-state, which had fought against its fellow Greeks, to unite Boeotia and become a major political player once more. But the big fear it had had been realised, that was, invasion by another Greek power, and it resisted this and rebelled against it. But at the same time, there was one itch it couldn't scratch, one humiliation that it needed to address. This was Plataea, not the battle, but the place. Plataea, as I mentioned earlier, and I went into in the Thebes Walls Teeth in Persian episode, had been a Boeotian town which decided to ally with Athens, albeit after Sparta had rejected it. Plataea was several miles away, and now Boeotia was united, they might be able to do something about this. And so it came about that one spring evening in 431, a force of 300 Thebans made their way to Plataea. At first glance, this is a laughably small number of men to take against a walled city, but these men walked up to one of the gates and were just let in. And that's because they'd been aided by a pro-Theban faction in the city. This pro-Theban faction gave the addresses of key individuals to the Theban force. These were most likely politicians who either need to be killed or captured. But the Thebans ignored them, 
and instead they made their way to the marketplace and addressed the people there. The Herald stated that anyone who wished for the Plataea to return back to Thebes could just join them. Initially, the Plataeans panicked and agreed, but then they realised that this wasn't a large occupying force. It was just 300 men. So the Plataeans spent the night preparing a counterattack. A giveaway would have been for them to have been seen out on the streets. To help them get around, passageways were cut between houses. This might sound odd, but Greek houses weren't the most solid of constructions, and burglars were in fact referred to as wall piercers, because that's what you did to get in. No Tom Cruise type entries hanging on wires. Nope, you just cut a hole. As well as this, barricades were put up at strategic points. The Thebans were unaware of the trap which was being built around them. Just before dawn, the Plataeans made their move. The Thebans stood next to no chance. One of the big problems in antiquity and even in the modern day is that capturing a city is nothing like holding one. The invading force is often unaware of the layout of the city, so residents can just appear and attack from one point before dissolving around a corner. Slaves and women joined in, hurling down tiles and objects from the roofs above. The Thebans were now solely concerned with their survival, which meant getting out of Plataea or Dodge pretty quickly. Unfortunately, the gate by which they had sneaked in was secured against them, and in one pitiful example of the chaos, a group headed to a building next to a wall, thinking it was a gatehouse, which would therefore allow them to escape. But no, this was in fact just a building next to a wall. They were surrounded and surrendered. Thebes had sent an additional larger force, which presumably was meant to meet up and support the initial advance party of those 300 Thebans, but this had been delayed by heavy rain and slowed their progress. As it finally approached Batia, it was met by a few Thebans who had managed to escape and could do nothing. A herald was sent to Thebes from Batia. The main issue for both sides was what to do with those Theban prisoners, who now numbered around 180. Thucydides reported a crucial difference in what happened next, rather what was negotiated next. For a Patea, these would be returned after further negotiations, but for Thebes, these would be returned simply when their forces left the area around Patea. Whichever of these was correct, it would be later given as the position by each of the party. However, there's somewhat of an irrelevance to it as well, because as soon as the Theban force had left Plataea, or the area outside Plataea, these prisoners were put to death, and this decision was later to have huge implications. Thucydides placed the incident at Plataea front and centre of his work, the Peloponnesian War. This is the Peloponnesian War, which you'd most likely heard about, as opposed to the First Peloponnesian War, which I spoke about earlier. Much like the First Peloponnesian War, this one involved Greek city-states lining up more or less as they had done previously as either Team Athens or Team Sparta. It started in 431 and finished in 404, though I should mention that it wasn't one ongoing conflict, it was formed of different events. Events of Plataea didn't end with the execution of the hostages, and I suppose you probably worked that one out. In 429, a Spartan force arrived under King Archidamus, and despite what you might think, namely, uh-oh, Spartans, they were a more objective faction to deal with, and Plataea sent out heralds to negotiate. I'm not going to go into the exact specifics of the negotiation, though they are quite interesting to see how either side perceives what they've done and what they haven't done. However, what the most important thing was the overarching position Thebes had put Sparta in all of this. Sparta needed Thebes. It needed Thebes to apply that pressure on the border with Athens, to soak up resources Athens might be using against them or elsewhere, and offer Sparta a safe footing for its armies venturing north. Thucydides later described Sparta as regretting the outcome here, but the realisation was it had to abandon the moral compass and pick up the political one. As a result, Sparta, Thebes and thus the Boeotians began to lay siege against Plataea. I'm not exactly sure what your thoughts are about sieges in the 5th century, but I'll just quickly explain what they weren't. They weren't large rolling towers and people leaping off ladders, and they weren't particularly dynamic affairs at all. Siege technology was just that, a technology which needed experts and a lot of money and resources. So building a siege tower wasn't something you could easily do, and it didn't in fact become something used by the Greeks until the early 4th century, and then in Sicily by Dionysus of Syracuse. What Greeks tended to do was encircle and build a wall around the city in question and just wait it out. 
In tandem with this, the besieging party would try to recruit a faction within that city who would either leave a gate unlocked or perhaps try to bring down those in power and bring the city back over to them. And there was usually a faction or two who were either aligned to the besiegers in some way or simply opportunists. And think about at Plataea, it's exactly how those Thebans had got in. But that was less likely to occur now, as Plataea only had resolute defenders numbering around 400. Much of the population had been moved to Athens prior to the siege starting. Sparta and her Boeotian allies built a wall around Plataea and then a further wall around themselves on their exposed side. The distance between the two was around 16 feet and in this space the Boeotians and Spartans waited and watched. It's worth remembering as well that warfare at this point was seasonal with armies being active in the summer months. This made sieges even more of a drain. So when the campaigning season ended, a small force was left to continue the siege. Walls, counter walls and even a botched attempt with fire followed. Battering rams were used against the walls, but these were met by log beams held horizontally above the walls on rows before being dropped down upon them. But time did its work and in 427 the starving Plataean defenders surrendered to the Spartans. What occurred next gives some insight into the Theban sense of revenge. The Spartans agreed to judge the city and Plataea made a good case and perhaps it was a little too good. Fearing that the Spartans might be a bit too lenient, a Theban representative jumped in and made a none too convincing case, except for one point, those dead prisoners that they'd executed just that bit earlier. Sparta was in the same bind as it had been in before and the outcome reflected this. The Plataean defenders were shown no mercy and executed. The city was then used to house exiles and migrants for a year before being razed to the ground with only the temples left. This was brutal and I suspect it shocked the Greeks at the time. A city which was the only one to have sent troops to fight the Persians at Marathon alongside Athens and had given its name to a very famous battle where Greeks united and fought Persians and repelled them, was no more. And not because of an invading force, but because of fellow Greeks, and even worse, its neighbours. With Plataea gone, Thebes had its sights set on one place, the very city which Plataea had defected to, Athens. But the Athenians weren't dupes. They'd been in this game for a long while now, and if anything, had a few tricks up their sleeves. In 424 the two clashed, though this time it was Athens who made the first move. Well, actually, a series of first moves. Before I get to that though, here's a little something from Hellenic history. Have you ever wondered what happened to the Greek world after the death of Alexander the Great? Who the Ptolemies were? Or how the Romans managed to conquer Greece? Then I've got just the thing for you. My name is Elke, and I run Hellenistic History. As the name suggests, Hellenistic History is a project dedicated at exploring all facets of the Hellenistic period. Want to find out more? Head on over to our website, www.hellenistichistory.com, where you can find tons of articles, games, quizzes, and other educational material. Or you can follow us on social media at, at Hellenistic History, where we share daily updates about this interesting period in Greek history. Once again, that's www.hellenistichistory.com or at Hellenistic History on Instagram and other social media. Thanks to Elki there at Hellenic History. I'm going to put a link to the website on my episode notes at the ancientblogger.com website. So you can also find it there as well as the Instagram and everything else that Elkie mentioned. And if you're interested and you want to swap ads or promos or just tell me about something and tell you listening about something to do with ancient history, just give me a shout. I'm always up for getting the word round. Back then to Athens and its cunning plan. Three locations in Boeotia were identified. Cephe, which is a port on the Corinthian Gulf. Corinea, a town I've already mentioned, and Delium, which was a sanctuary site with a temple to Apollo. Each of these offered Athens something different. Cephe would give them access to the Corinthian Gulf, and thus a key strategic naval base. Corinea was to the west of Thebes, so it would provide them with a base on the other side of it, and Delium was close to the border with Attica and east of Thebes. 
With these three locations secured, Boeotia would be pinned down. Not only could Athens launch raids from them, they would act as recruiting posts and might even result in a few other locations in Boeotia to switch over to Athens. They were all different places though and required a slightly different plan. Professor Kagan in his book The Peloponnesian War, which I'll put in the notes and again if you've read The Peloponnesian War or are interested in it, you've got to read Kagan, it's absolutely fantastic. Well he outlines it quite neatly. For Carinae and Sife, the operation would assume that similar to what Thebes had done in Plataea namely sending a small force to link up with rebels in the city who would then turn it over to them. So this needed to be a covert affair, whereas at Delium a larger force would be sent to fortify the sanctuary and set up a large base there. Ideally each operation would help the other and if it pulled off Thebes wouldn't know what to do first. Did it send a single large force to Carinea and thus leave eastern Boeotia open to raiding parties? Or did it do the reverse and choose Carinea or Sife to attack? In reality, there would be no good answer, and as mentioned, Thebes would be placed firmly on the back foot. As it often goes, a big reward means a big risk, and the biggest problem Athens had was keeping this quiet. And even then, there was a coordination. To quote Hannibal, not the Carthaginian commander, but the leader of the A-team, I love it when a plan comes together. But would it come together? The small force of 40 ships left Athens in August for Sife and went northwest to collect the men it needed. It arrived at Sife in November, possibly a bit earlier than it should have done, but timing wasn't the issue. The plan had been betrayed, and Sife was now heavily garrisoned. The force was unable to complete its part of the mission. Before a single hoplite had left a ship, the whole Athenian plan was dead in the water. This meant that the force at Delium would now receive the full attention of Boeotia and Thebes. The Athenian general Hippocrates arrived with a force of both hoplites and other troops numbering around 17,000. In three days, the sanctuary had been fortified with a ditch, wooden towers and walls. With their job done, the army started to march back, leaving a garrisoned force there. The Athenian army was now very vulnerable, because the lighter troops had been sent on ahead, with the heavier infantry, mostly hoplites, resting up before beginning the trek home. Yet the Boeotians resisted attacking for a while, but one of the eleven commanders, a Theban called Pagondas, pleaded for their army to attack. Whether this was just a nice dramatic touch by Thucydides, we don't know, but Pagondas managed to sway the minds of the other commanders and the two armies clashed. The Battle of Delium in 424 was a dramatic affair. The Athenians were lacking their lighter troops, but they were still very dangerous. Pagondas decided on an unusual strategy. He reinforced his right flank with the intent that this would crush the Athenians quickly and lead to a victory. Now there are many variables in a battle which generals have often had to contend with, and the boggy ground on that day was one which had escaped Pagondas attention. The juggernaut right flank was now reduced to a crawl, and worse still his left flank was being picked apart by the Athenians. Something had to be done. In a final roll of the dice, Pagondas sent cavalry from his right wing and round the back of the hill behind his line. It then appeared on the other side of the battlefield, behind the Athenian right flank, which was on the verge of victory. The Athenians panicked. They thought another army had appeared behind them. Rout and panic, those two sons of the war god Ares now spread through the Athenian line. It fragmented into men running for their lives. These were now chased down by the Boeotian cavalry and the lighter troops. Well, apart from one very famous Athenian. Socrates had fought that day and in Plato's Symposium he was acclaimed by Alcibiades who also fought that day as cavalry. Socrates was praised for his calm retreat, which ensured that those pursuing him left him in favour of easier and more panicking options. Delium was a huge victory for Thebes. But now what to do with the Athenian force garrisoned in the fortified temple? You've heard how difficult it was to take Plataea, so what could you do against a largely well-reinforced wooden fort? Well, there was of course always fire, and this had been used at Plataea, but not to particularly any good effect. What was required was a way of focusing it, and Thucydides wrote of a new type of siege engine. A long wooden beam was split in two and hollowed. In the space, a long iron pipe was inserted, and then the beam was closed together. At one end of the beam was a cauldron with pitch and some bellows. Voila, a primitive flamethrower. This was mounted on a cart and brought to a section of the wall, where it did its job, and the Athenians fled. Delium had now been retaken. Thebes was now running a more than respectable win ratio versus Athens and her allies. It had beaten Athens in the field and taken back Plataea. It also countered an attempted coup in Boeotia. But then disaster came in the form of peace. 
After ten years of fighting, both Sparta and Athens had enough reasons to want a break. Both had suffered as a result of the war, so when Sparta announced that it was seeking terms with Athens, the response was mixed amongst its allies. For the likes of Corinth and Thebes, it was outrageous. They not only voted against the idea, but when the Peace of Nicias was announced in 421, they failed to acknowledge it. Thebes did negotiate its own peace with Athens, but this was a ten-day rolling affair. And here we can see something of a crack developing between Sparta and Thebes. Here was Thebes demonstrating that, though it was a member of the Peloponnesian League and worked in alignment with Sparta, when its own interests weren't best served, it was happy to take its own course. Perhaps as a further snub to Sparta was the reaction to a revolt in Heraclea, which sat in central Greece and thus close to Boeotia. This was originally a Spartan colony, but when the Spartan force was expelled from it, Thebes had decided to just claim it as its own rather than restore it back to Sparta. But the Sparta-Thebes relationship wasn't broken, it was just being tested, and a controversial event in 420 gave the two a chance to make their declaration of friendship very public, and possibly in the grandest way, at the Olympics. Sparta was in fact banned from the Olympics at this time, because they'd infringed the Olympic truce and attacked a fort. It might surprise you, but Sparta had a good track record in the chariot races. Their teams were held in high esteem, and this year a Spartan called Lycas offered his team to Thebes, and his team was successful. To add insult to injury, Lycas then strode onto the track and crowned the charioteer himself. To add injury to insult, the judges then gave Lycas a beating with canes. This little piece of political theatre must have rung around the spectators with this simple message. Sparta could still achieve its objectives with Thebes in its side. By the way, if you thought the Olympics was an event separate from politics and it was all about sport, please allow me to wander off, buy a coffee and then spit it out across the keyboard. The games at Olympia were soaked in politics, as is my keyboard with caffeine. Just as an example, the supposed victor lists, which have the first recorded winner in 776, were most likely composed to make a political point. If you want to hear more about this and how the games developed, then check out my episode on the Olympics. Prior to the events of 420, Thebes had proud association with the Olympic Games and the other Pan-Hellenic Games. In case you weren't aware, the Olympics or Games at Olympia was one of four Pan-Hellenic Games, the other three being the Isthmian, Nemean and Pythian. Winning an event might make you an oikos held name, perhaps for generations. And what would certainly help if you could afford it was to have your success captured in verse. One Theban poet came to master this, and you might have heard of his name, Pindar. Pindar was thought to have been born around 520, and if he could afford it, he'd write an ode about you, praising your abilities and including a myth or two. This itself meant that Pindar became a valuable source of myths. He died around the 440s, so just before Thebes rode to lead Boeotia and break from Athens. Pindar was an acclaimed figure during his lifetime and after it. There's even an anecdote about him which I'll keep dry for the next episode, otherwise it will kind of ruin it. Pindar is also fantastic because what he allows me to do is segue into another area Thebes featured in, and not always favourably, and that's because there were not just poets in the 5th century, but also playwrights. By the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, Greek theatre was a popular and established art form. Its biggest stage was at Athens, and in a festival held each March, the Great or City Dionysia, and if you're interested in hearing how it developed, well, that is to say Greek tragedy, well, here's a second chamber's plug, as I recently did an episode on that. Greek tragedy and Greek comedy were in fact Athenian tragedy and Athenian comedy. By the time of the Peloponnesian War, Athens had a cultural engine which it shared with its fellow Greeks and sometimes aimed at them. People could travel from across Greece to watch and listen. And tragedies were complex things. They dealt with age-old myths but were often set about unpicking contemporary moral positions and asking taboo questions. Having them set in the past, and often not in Athens, acted as a suitable safety valve. As such, moral questions of the day were safely set in the mouths of gods, heroes and mortals, safely away from Athens. One location was dripping in myth and had some of the most juicy tales in all of Greece. That place, as you probably guessed, was Thebes. It made sense that the Athenian playwrights would feature the city. But how did they view it? How did Athens deal with a rival city through its art form? In short, was there a bias against Thebes? As you might expect, there's a wider debate about this, but two plays written and staged in the first ten years of the war give us some insight. The first was Oedipus the King, dating to 428 by Sophocles, and the second, The Suppliant, staged in 423 and by Euripides. 
Sophocles depicted Oedipus as slowly realising the horror of his situation, namely having killed his father and married his mother. It's all set in Thebes, and in his book Tyranny and Political Culture in Ancient Greece, James McClue sums up the depiction of Thebes, and I quote, In Sophocles, Thebes is permanently monarchical, dominated by an antiquated and unimproved concept of justice, and unable to control its political destiny. End quote. It's easy to see what McGlue is getting at here. Though there is an obvious counter to it, the build-up of the drama, drop by drop, requires Thebes to be a stagnant and static place, otherwise the revelation Oedipus has would be over in a few lines. To put it another way, a prison break movie needs a daunting stronghold as a backdrop, not a petting zoo. There's also an interesting twist which has been pointed out regarding this play, namely that it involved a subtle criticism of Pericles, the famous Athenian leader, who had actually died a few years earlier. Athens had been on the receiving end of a plague at the outbreak of the war, which had claimed Pericles as one of its many victims. Pericles was considered an intellectual, perhaps one who even questioned the gods, and Sophocles' play opens with Thebes in the grip of a plague caused by the actions of Oedipus. He is also characterised as an intellectual, and one who considers his mental prowess above that of religious devotion. And there's one final connection between the two, a family curse. With Pericles, this was because of the actions of his ancestors, and Oedipus, well, you, you can work that one out for yourself. It's plausible, then, that Thebes was being used by an Athenian to comment on an Athenian leader. Athens is more openly contrasted with Thebes in Euripides' play The Suppliants. Delium may well have been fresh in the minds of many when watching this play, and it's worth considering this because Thebes isn't depicted with much appeal. It should be noted, though, that Thebes isn't the setting of the play but it's more about the characterisation of Thebes through the character of a Theban herald who clashes with the Athenian hero Theseus. The mythical backdrop to this is the Seven Against Thebes, a very popular myth in its own right. In short, Athens is petitioned to recover bodies which are being denied proper burial. This was a fundamental belief held by Greeks, and so by opposing it, Thebes is acting as about as non-Greek as you could do. In contrast, Athens is acting as a defender of Greek core values, and there's an extra level of outrage reserved for the Athenians. The herald scoffs that a city could be ruled by a mob, which was another way of saying democracy. Theseus gives as good as he gets, and I wonder if the bruising exchange was a result of the Athenian defeat at Delium. As I mentioned earlier, whether Thebes placed Thebes as a sort of nemesis or anti-Athens in its plays is its own debate, and there are merits to both sides of the argument. It's not immediately clear whether there is a bias or if it's appearing as a result of other artistic dynamics. And even then we'd be basing this on the surviving plays, which are greatly outnumbered by those which didn't survive. From other plays, namely comedies by Aristophanes, we're shown that Thebes was a place of culture, in particular music. The comic playwright Aristophanes registered heavily on Thebes as a place of music. In his play The Arcanians, where a Boeotian is followed around by flute players, you get the sense that they got a bit annoying. And there were also eels from Boeotia, which were considered a prime delicacy. In short, it wasn't all that bad. Though Athens was to stage and develop tragedies, it had one of its own towards the end of the 5th century. It's time to leave the stage and head back to the Peloponnesian War, though in all honesty, very briefly. Much of the Theban involvement in the war was in those opening 10 years. The war resumed in 413 and Thebes really takes a back seat. And by this I mean there were no big or large set-piece battles between the two. This may well be because Thebes didn't overextend itself. Where it does feature in the Peloponnesian War in those first ten years is largely where Athens is invaded or picked a fight with it. But what was certainly true was that Thebes was a big voice at the end of the war. This ended in 404 with Athens surrendering. And I began this episode with Thebes having surrendered after Plataea. 75 years later on, its main rival was now in a similar position. But what would the outcome be? Both Corinth and Thebes wanted one simple outcome, for Athens to suffer the same fate as Plataea. A Theban was reported to have asked for Athens to be raised to the ground and left as a place where cattle might graze. Sounds really quite sinister. But Sparta was still technically in charge, and it must have realised the position it was in. Don't forget, it had been Sparta which had lit the fuse between these two cities over a century before, when it suggested that Plataea ally with Athens. But now Sparta had a new problem. With Spartan help, Thebes had risen through two wars to become a major player in Greece once more, and now Sparta may have looked at Thebes as it had once done Athens. Thebes had shown that it was very happy to act independently of Sparta and defy it, 
It hadn't accepted the peace of Nicias. And then there was that incident with Heraclea, even though, by the way, Sparta eventually got it back. If Sparta had a new rival, then it needed a new power to help address the balance. So it declined to bring destruction to Athens. Sparta, now ironically, needed Athens to keep Thebes in check. Something, something history, something, something repeating itself. If this was a thinking behind it all, it was well funded, because in the 4th century, Thebes was about to take the fight to Sparta, and the two would clash, leading to a devastating result. In fact, the following century would see at least two major powers in Greece made redundant, and Thebes was involved in both, and amidst the ruins of all of this, there would be the rise of one of the most famous characters in history. But I'll get to that in the next episode. Until then, please review if you can, or just come and find me on social media, Always worth thinking, Ancient Blogger. It's Instagram, it's Facebook, it's Twitter, it's TikTok. And there's the ancientblogger.com website with the episode notes. Until then, keep safe and stay well.